primero, o teórico de la interpretación física, para que no esté para nada. Paco Chiqui, please, yo soy la internata, en la supervisión de Pedro Barrido. Then he moved to the US with Christian, at IBM. Then Rome, with Victor Nero, also Spignani. He has worked mostly on topics of statistical mechanics, renumeration group, cell uh, polarized criticality, systems with absor absorbing states, more than one, mm -hmm. actually. KPC in drawing surfaces. Uh, more recently, as many of us has moved a little bit away from the, I don't know, but the light of <coughs> from the pure <coughs> topic of statistical mechanics to networks, as well as a very interesting work. Can you tell us something about earthquakes? In the, is that what you to? Well, I think it's quite famous recently uh -huh. because he has predicted that our brain has many earthquakes. <laughs> Well, this is Welcome to that. <laughs> Thank you, Raúl, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be sitting here. I had forgotten it was in English, so I was ready to <laughs> say this in Spanish. So I, I should. I should say thank you for people for inviting me, but it was myself who invited me. <laughs> Please, I'm coming to. So I, I don't know how to. Well, Raúl was kind enough as to give me this opportunity and. I was here in holidays these very sunny days, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and again, it's a pleasure to be here with, with you. So today I'm, I'm going to give you this, this uh, talk on some aspects of brain dynamics, but uh, we'll have a very large introduction, so hopefully we will go step by step and we will arrive to these concepts of grid spaces and big sheet scales that you have seen in the title. The title is, by the way, a bit different from the one I gave to the organizers. Here, here you have uh, our view in Granada. Is, actually, is the, my house is very nearby. It's like where you have this view, so come to visit. We'll treat you well. Okay, so I start with this experiment published by uh, Bex and Dietmar Plant in the National Institute of Health in the States, in which they studied, they did the experiment. They took sli a slice of a rat uh, brain, put it on a, on a petri dish like this, and put on the top of it some electrodes, so this detects electrical activity. You see the neurons there and the connections. And they studied what goes on, and they detected for the first time that when you do that, you observe the following thing. You have here a raster plot, so this is time. These are the labels of the different electrodes. And if an electrode is detecting something, you put a dot. Okay, so you have the, the, the activity is localized here. Then there is a lot of activity here. Then some silent period, and so on. Okay? And people have discovered this before and used to refer to this as neural synchronization. So at some point, you have that some activity. The resolution, and you see that actually it's not a synchronous peak, but you have something different. You have first activity here, then it propagates to some neighbor right here, uh, electrode here, and then here, and so on. So you can translate this into a spatial temporal plot. So this is some time, time after, time after, and you can measure the statistics of these avalanches. So you define the silent period as a period of some length in which there is nothing, and then something happens, and you measure how many electrodes were activated, so you can plot the number of electrodes, the probability that you have an avalanche with that size, and you have this striking power loss. You have that this is critical somehow, it's a power loss, it's correlated. So immediately people said that there is some kind of criticality going on in these networks, and a bunch of empirical experiments were done to test this. And this has been checked, verified, in all possible variations. So for example, instead of taking some slice of the cortex to take some culture in which you actually you row the network, and they have measured this in monkeys, which are alive or awake or with anesthesia, without anesthesia, they do a bunch of things, and at the end of the day, they see that spontaneous activity is essentially a power law. 
The first striking thing is actually that there is some hazardous activity because you have these this, uh, networks with essentially nothing going on, but spontaneously, just out of the blue, they have these avalanches. And as the statistic is a power law, this is similar to earthquakes somehow. So it's silent, and eventually you have earthquakes, and these earthquakes, avalanches of activity, are of all possible sizes compatible with, with the sample you have. Also, people doing more mesoscopic measurements, like this one here. Here, the electrodes are recording not just a few neurons, but a large area. And you do them, for example, this is MEG, magnetoencephalogram measurements. People have done fMRI, so magneto resonance, a bunch of different things. And essentially, everybody finds these power laws. Okay. Also, looking at different type of activity, not, not just electrical activity, but in this case, synchronization activity. So you look to two different areas in the brain, and you define this phase lock interval, which is the time in which they have synchronous activity. You look at the time series, and for some time, they are synchronous. And the duration of this thing is also generically distributed as a power law. It's another evidence that you have this robust criticality in human brain networks. And there has been really a bunch, an avalanche of works on these things. I put here some, some things. For example, people are measuring long time correlations in space and in time, which is a signature of criticality. And, uh, well, a, a bunch of different things. For example, in this one, people are studying what neurobiological ingredients do you have to touch in order to have apparent criticality in the network that, that you measure. And uh, also, these other people realize that when this criticality does not work, when you don't have criticality, that means that something pathological is going to occur, for example, epileptic seizures. Or in other words, in people with epileptic attacks, <coughs> the distributions are not power loss or something else. Okay, so I arrived to this problem because I have worked, as Raul well said in, in the introduction, for, for some time on the theory of self-organized criticality. That's it, on the mechanisms why natural systems seems to like to behave like critical points. You know that in the theory of phase transitions that we have studied at school, most of us at least, you have different phases, phase A, phase B, and you have criticality only at a very specific point separating these two completely different things. And power loss appear just at a very precise point. Okay? So it's somehow shocking, surprising that in nature you have many phenomena which are distributed like power loss. And the theory of self-organized criticality was an attempt to understand that. And I contributed to this myself with well-known co-authors 10, 12 years ago. And that was the famous SOC, self-organized criticality. Even if some people call it self-organized criminality. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as soon as people discover these critical like avalanches in the brain, some people, including myself, start seeing if the theory we have developed 10 years before was useful for this problem. Some people said yes, and they wrote in Nature Physics. We said no, and we wrote the Journal of Statistical Mechanics, so it had less impact. Anyway, I'm, I don't want to talk about this. What I want to, maybe some of you recognize this picture, it's Mr. Darwin on these guys. Here's the beagle. The question I want to discuss, or I wanted to explore, is not, well, it's not just if the theory we have works, because that theory had some assumptions, and I have the impression that those assumptions were not really going on in the brain. For example, one of the, of the assumptions is separation of time scales, so that you perturb the system very rarely, and then you have a very quick response, but I don't think that is the case with the brain, which you have a lot of perturbations and a lot of relaxation. I don't think the hypothesis of self-organized criticality really works here. So we were looking for different type of explanations. And the, the general question I was interested in is if the, if the criticality in this system, in the brain, cannot be explained or is not a usual example of self-organized criticality, it's something else. So is there some type of evolutionary or adaptive mechanism which has selected for the virtues of criticality 
So it's not like an earthquake. We don't believe that earthquakes have been selected to be distributed like that for any reason. But in the brain, it's different because it's a living being and it has to do some tasks and maybe it's convenient. So actually, in the very last years, people have begun to study the functional advantages of a brain being critical. <coughs> okay? And these functional advantages are things which are specific to living systems, which has to compute or perform some tasks, and not just the standards of organized criticality for inanimate matter. Okay? So actually, people have claimed and proved under some assumptions that if you want to transmit information in a neural system, system the best thing you can do is to have it to work nearby a critical point. If you want to increase, increase the memory capacity, again, you have to work at a critical point. Maximal dynamical range, optimal computational capabilities, largest possible dynamical repertoires, you name it. You have a bunch of apparently functional capacities which are optimized if you work right at that point. And many of you, for sure, have heard of this, this very seminal paper by Langton in the 90s, was it right? In which this, he said they were working on, on, on the theory of computation, so trying to design computers and so on, which are which work in an efficient way. And they claim that a, a machine which has to com compute, which has to do a lot of very complex things, as any real living system needs to do, has to work at the edge of chaos. So at the borderline between two different phases. One would be a chaotic phase and another uh, an ordered phase. Let me try to explain this a bit more careful, carefully in this transparency. So imagine, for example, let's look at this. I will try to give you just the idea of what this edge of chaos or criticality is. Imagine that you ha we have the, here this one-dimensional system, and this is time here, okay? And a <coughs> spot here, dot, means that I have created the perturbation. So I have my system in some state, and I put the perturbation here. And now I look how this perturbation propagates through time. So this damage is spreading type of thing that we do in statistical mechanics. So now depending on parameters of the system, you can have two different limits, limiting cases. Here, perturbation survives for a limited amount of time, perturbates a, a region around it, but eventually it dies off. And when the perturbation is gone, the system behaves as it would behave without perturbation. So it's removed. Instead here, this would be the ordered phase, inactive phase in that, in that. Instead, in this limit, the propagation, the perturbation propagates all through the system, creating confusion everywhere, so it's, it's everywhere. So if you want to compute, to do some, some process, information processing, and you put some noise, the noise perturbs all the signals. So this is not useful if you want to transfer information. The chaotic phase is no good. This one is not good either, because if this attractor is so robust that when you create perturbations, the perturbations do not arrive anywhere, imagine you are hearing something, and the signal just perturbates a couple of neurons and then it dies out, it doesn't reach the outside of the brain or other areas. So it's not good at all. So if you want to do complex computation and do things, interesting things, you have to work right in the limits of perturbations spreading out and perturbations dying out. And this is a critical point, this is the edge of chaos. So here you have too much order, here you have too much chaos, and the interesting things happen just around here, just around a critical point. Okay. Actually, uh, last year I think it was, some people did these measurements. So they studied how the perturbations propagate in real neural networks. And these are uh, neural networks of rats after some days of development. Here the rat has is 10 years old. And what you measure, what people measure, is that the system is super critical. So propagations Propagation. Perturbation propagates a lot. But after one month, the system is subcritical, and it's only asymptotically when it's mature that it reaches the critical state. So all this evidence suggests that the brain is organizing itself to work around the, a, a critical point. But it's not necessarily critical. In some stages of development, it's not. 
No, this is uh, in vivo, in rats. Oh, it's in vitro? Okay, I, I was lying to you. <laughs> then I don't know. But, but you have a maturation of tissues, a neural tissues in vivo. I'm not an expert on this, as you can notice, but they do maturation of uh, neural tissues. So, what is actually the claim? Is that our brain is somehow critical by evolutionary process, no, but by learning or by aging, you reach criticality? I have made no claim whatsoever. Well, I just said. Okay, I make a question. I want to understand first if there is some critical like behavior, and second, if it can be related to just mechanistic explanations, as earthquakes, or there is something behind. And I just presented different possibilities. I said it could be mechanistic. Some people say you have functional advantages, so maybe some adaptation. And this seems to point in the direction of adaptation, right? Well, no, adaptation means in evolutionary time, right? So as, as the species is evolving, right? Right. Here is, is aging. It's, it's an individual yeah, but, who is but the system. learning of aging, so that's a different mechanism. Right. But, well, but I, I can call also this adaptation in the sense that the, the network is adapting itself to the final state. I don't think really evolution is the point, but let me come to this, okay? We go step by step. Okay, so we have here this phase diagram, inactive order phase, chaotic phase, active phase, and one critical point. Our point of view at some point was to realize that we wanted to escape from the, if you want, the dictatorship of the critical point in the following way. We know, if you have studied some statistical mechanic of disorder systems, imagine that you have a magnetic material like this, which is not perfect. It's not a perfect cube, but you have some impurities, some holes, so it's some disorder thing. Okay? We know, I knew, that when you have that situation and you study an order disorder transition on the top of that, what you get is a different scenario. You have an ordered phase, a disordered phase, but you have a whole range of parameters here, extended region, not just a point, extended region, which is called a Griffith phase in the jargon, in which you have generic power loss. Okay? So this is the concept of Griffith space that I can try to illustrate here in two minutes. Two minutes, very cheap introduction to Griffith spaces, but I try to do it. Okay, so this is Robert Griffiths in Oxford. He introduced the concept in the 70s, early 80s. And the situation is like this. Uh, imagine we study some ordering phenomenon, for example, magnetism. Magnetism, we have this two-dimensional system here, and we have spins, and the spins can point up or down, and so on. But imagine now that you, we have some disorder, so some dilution. The system is not, not pure here, we don't have any. Okay. But it can happen, just by chance, that you have regions like this blue one, in which there is no missing link, missing spin. Okay? So this portion of the system be behaves like a pure system. Okay? So a subsystem behaves like the pure system and the whole one is like an impure one. Look at this picture. This is easy model, but we've put some dil dilution with probability P. So with probability, if dilution is zero, we have the easy model here. And we have order, 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 critical point of the easy model and disorder. Okay? But if we put some dilution, for example here, we have order, 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 some intermediate, intermediate region, which is the Griffiths region, and then disorder. And, uh, and in that region, we have generic power loss. I have the proof here, well, it's a proof. It's an, it's an argument to show you how it works. I can tell you very, very briefly. First, when you, the, the lattice is disorder, you have to lower more the temperature to get it ordered, okay? So if you have more intrinsic disorder in the system, the new critical point of this disorder system is, is lower. Okay, but it can happen that for a temperature here in between, the pure system would be ordered because the critical temperature is here. So this blue, the blue region before could be in the order region if we are here, but the global system is disordered. Okay? 
So this is the main idea. If, if you get this, you have you already understand what security is. So I say it again. <coughs> this was the original critical temperature of the pure model, easy model if you want. Then the substrate, the lattice, is disordered, so the new critical temperature is lower. Okay? For example, in the case of dilution, the critical temperature is here. But we have regions, up at the blue one in the previous slide, which locally is pure. So if I have this temperature here, that region should be ordered, locally ordered. But the global system is disordered. Okay? So we have these regions which can have different sizes and can be ordered. Order means that in order to go to the disorder phase, you have to jump a barrier, which is exponential in the size. <coughs> no, I said it the other way around. One of these remains ordered for a time, which is exponential in the size. It's like you have to jump a barrier, it's a Arrhenius law. But the regions can be as large as you want. This a, a, a region with no impurities can be statistically very rough, but this is exponentially rare. The point is that you can have very large regions which are pure and survive for very large times. And it's the convolution of these two exponential, exponential here and exponential here, that gives you the power law. Okay? So I'm not sure if exponential was completely transparent, but the, the, the take home message is if you have rare regions, regions that can be ordered, disordered, different, locally can have different properties, at the outcome of that is a whole broad region which behaves kind of like a critical point. Okay. You have power loss generically in a whole region. Questions? How can this be generic? That the convolution of two exponentials is a power law? I mean, it should be in uh, some... I mean, if A and B are quite different, uh, the, the surviving would see no, with this, right? with these two things here, in the large, no, if you do this, this convolution, it's exactly power law, with l corrections, maybe logarithmic corrections or, or so on, but you can do that. I can do that for you very quickly. Be later. It, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. the convolution yeah. of, of power laws is one of the well-known mechanisms to generate power laws. Com you, you do this convolution of things which are exponentially unlikely, but survive exponentially now. Convolution, and you get that. Yeah, the, uh, the space appears even if the system is not uh, fragmented, or uh, I mean, because this, when you are looking, there is also fragmentation transition. So, right. Uh, you are over the fragmentation, or uh, no, no, no. This system does does not need to be fragmented. Okay. You have a system which just holds here and holds there, and you have this property. And key point again: there are regions which are ordered and local regions which are not ordered. This is the key point. Okay, so now we use this. And uh, we have realized with some quotes or some friends of mine that you can have this type of rigid phases on networks. Because when you have a network, well, now you can study many different processes, you can do a lot of things on top of networks. But in many of these processes, whether you are in one phase or in the other phase depends on your connectivity. For example, if a node is connected to many other ones and you're contagion uh, trying to, to infect them, it's very likely that that node locally is in the active phase because it's propagating a lot. It's propagating to many people around. Okay? While if the connectivity is low, probably you are in the other phase in which you are not percolating through the system or propagating a lot. So you have that depending on the part of the network where you are, you can be in one place or in the other. Okay? And with this intuition, we explore the possibility of having rigid spaces and complex networks. The fact that locally you can be in one place or in the other depending on where you are in your system. Okay? And the answer was yes, you have rigid spaces in the system. Here is a phase diagram, doesn't mind. But look at this generic power loss. Usually you have this the decay of the activity. So you put an infection and you in everywhere in the network and you see how it decays, depending on some one parameter. If the parameter is large, you get some endemic state of infection. If it's very low, you fall exponentially. But there is a broad area here where you have decays with power loss. And this power loss change continuously upon during the parameter. Okay? So this is a, how a grid phase looks like. 
You could stay in the audience. Okay. okay, so the conclusion of this paper of us, it's already three years old, was that networks can have these rift spaces and generically power loss. But there is some key ingredients that the network has, has to have. And that ingredient is to have a finite topological dimension or connectivity dimension. Here is the definition of the topological dimension. So you sit at one node and you go L steps away. L could be the chemical distance in some notation. And you see how the network, how, how many points you can reach in the network in the network upon increasing L grows. Okay? So this is the definition of topological dimension. If you are in a lattice, for example, this is two. If you are in a cube, it's three. If you are in a small world network, that's infinite. Because in very few steps, faster than any power law, you are right everywhere. So a small world network, formally at least, this dimension is infinite. Okay? So what we conjecture and kind of prove is that you need a finite topological connectivity to have rigid spaces. Okay? And why is that? Well, I said before that to have rigid spaces you need rare regions, regions in which something strange happens. If you have an infinite topological dimension, means that the neighborhood neighborhood of any point is the whole lattice. So the very concept of locality is not there. The very concept of region is not present because every point sees every point. There is no point. <laughs> no point. It's, it's pointless talking about regions and regions behaving in different ways. Okay? So you need to have fine topological dimension. It's a key ingredient. By the way, we also studied what happened with the disorder is not in space, but in time. It's a work done in collaboration with people in the, the EFIS. And I'm not going to talk about that. What I'm talking about now, in the second part of the talk, is on this. The architecture of brain networks is intrinsically disordered. So you know that in the same way we have the genome project, which is well known, there is also a connectome project in which people are trying to map all neurons and all connections among them at very large, oh, at very detailed scale and at very large integration scale. So at all possible levels. And the human connectome project is one of them. They are also studying some monkeys and some worms. It is very much advanced. Here you have some nice picture in which you see actually the fibers of neurons, of well, nerve fibers connecting and moving. And then you have a more, if you increase the resolution, you can see inside of this fiber how it's done and so on. The only point I want, I need here is the obvious thing that this thing is very disordered. It's not like a lattice, it's not like a cube, it's something disordered. Okay? So, what people do is that they take different regions that they know, because from anatom anat anat how do you say? anatomic studies, anatomical studies, there are regions that they kind of know what they correspond to. And then, using the map before, they say, okay, how many connections do I have between this region and this region? So, they create this network here, which tells you, out of the different anatomical regions that we know we have, it's just a, a way to put labels. Uh, how many connections, how closely connected are pair by pair, okay? Look that the, the project is huge because people mention these numbers, 100 billion neurons, 100 trillion synapses, so it's a huge, huge thing. But the thing that interests me the most here is that when you go to study these networks that people have published, you see this type of ordering, hierarchical modular ordering. So this is the full brain, and it has like one, two different colors correspond to different regions. 
and as you get in one of the regions, then you have sub-regions, and so this is kind of a fractal type of things, hierarchical. DVD regions or real regions? Connection, structure. This is structure, okay? From the law, you have this hierarchical organization of the brain. It's one of the main findings of people studying the structure of these networks. So there is one central neuron? No, 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 no. This <laughs> I have something to read here. No, it's like, it's like, imagine you have the two hemispheres. The, the two, okay, so imagine now you, this central point would be this, and then it branches into the two hemispheres. And then inside every hemisphere, I'm, I'm making it up, obviously. No? You have, imagine, four regions. So this is just schematic plot for here you go to two, and here you go to three, and four, and so on. But this is plotted in a, in a thing with, uh, with symmetry. Okay? So this is just the whole thing, and then the spike oh, communities well, and so on. this point should represent a region in the, in the, in the, 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 the full, the full, the full This, the full, the full so brain. This, this, this point in the middle this is, is, a, is a given region in the brain. The full no, brain. this is the full brain. This is full brain, half brain, half brain, one region in this right hemisphere, one region. It's a dendrogram. <coughs> The technical name is then program, right? Okay. So if you go, if you could have all the information, at the last level you will have individual neurons. So you would say that neurons belongs to this region, which belongs to this subregion, which belongs to that, which belongs to the frontal lobe, which belongs to the so whole brain. It's not connectivity between neurons, it's detecting which, at which region, subregion belong, and then... Right. This is called a dendrogram, no? But then, then, then how you define a region? The region is because all the neurons there are connected, so how? You can do it in many different ways. It's like with... with no, the, po the point is that what you put there is the... It's key. how one region is, is embedded in another one. Right. You have algorithms to do that. It's like with the... It's com with com community detection so far. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how people did that. I, th those are my data so from some people here. Okay. You have community detection algorithms. Okay. The, the central one is the whole network. Right. Yeah? It's like when you attempt a classification of all living beings, you say living beings, then you have uh, eukaryotes and prokaryotes, and prokaryotes you have these five things, and here you have blah, 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 and then you have this thing. Okay? And how do you do that? I don't know. There are technicalities, is, you can do it in many different ways, I guess. But the important thing is that you have this type of a structure, okay? And why do I care about this structure? Because this type of fractal-like thing has intrinsically local regions, okay? So this region is very far away from this. It's not like a small world in which everything is integrated, every, you arrive everywhere very closely. No, no, you have, in any fractal structure, you have to follow very specific paths, and in particular, you have a finite topological dimension, I think. So the question was... What? I mean, because you can do it in, a, in the dimensionality of this. If you do a phylogenetic analysis of a network, you are going to find that. By construction, because you are going to, get, to have uh, this kind of topology. Right. But it's still the dimension can be infinity. Right. Could be. Yes, absolutely. So why let, let me go there. I, go, I already there in a few steps. So the question is this. Do brain networks see the perfect spaces? Okay, so to study that problem, uh, first we constructed some hierarchical network, an artificial one, okay? So a synthetic network. How do we do that? We take here a bunch of neurons, five in this case, and we connect them somehow. For example, in this example, they are fully connected, everyone connected to each one. And then we do this arrangement, hierarchical arrangement, in which guys here, nodes here, are connected to nodes here with some probability. And guys here are connected to guys here with smaller probability P2. This was P1, P2, and so on, P3, P4, and so on. Now, depending on how you change this P with the, with the hierarchical level, you can have different outputs. Okay, here is some mathematics of what you can get, but essentially, we work in a limit in which, in which what we take is uh, that the probability PE is P to the I, whatever. It's just a way 
to have what we wanted, which are that the number of neighbors grows like a power law, so we have a finite topological dimension, which is the requisite that we impose, or that we believe it's necessary to have locality and grid spaces. Of course, if, just to, to give you an idea, if P grows very fast, if even in very high levels you connect a lot, a lot, what you have is something which is small world, it's highly connected, so you have an infinite topological dimension. Instead, if P decays very fast, and for high levels is too tiny, you get disconnected regions, disconnected networks. So we work in the regime in between, in which the, the network is connected, but it's not everything connected to everything. So what we have is that the number of guys in the neighborhood grows like a power law. And the number of connections that in the uh, or whatever is not very weak? Not necessarily. I mean, you can keep it. You, we also have here a perfecto. We can we can tune, then the exponent depends on the perfecto. I mean, we can <coughs> we have a model, generic model to construct networks, and this we have a couple of parameters, so we can have different type of networks. Okay. Here is the plot of one of these networks in which again you see this hierarchical organization. The, the, the plot is not very good, but the color code corresponds to the communities. So essentially, you see say seven communities, but within each community you have three, four of them, and here you have more, so you have this whole hierarchical community type of structure. Okay, now we have some structure that we believe that somehow is similar to the one in the brain. <coughs> okay, if, if you want, I don't have it here, but I could construct a dendrogram for this thing that looks similar to the one for the brain. So everything connected, then we have some, you know what I mean. Okay, so now that we have the topology, we have the structure, we need some dynamics. And we do the simplest possible thing. The simplest possible model is this model A is something like contact process in epidemics, in which if you have activity in this neuron, you can propagate it with some, at some rate to a neighbor, or with some other rate, it just disappears. Okay, it's like contact process. We have studied a bunch of different dynamics. This is just an example, it's the simplest one. But we have studied a bunch of them. And for all of them, the conclusion is the same. Model B is another one, whatever. The conclusion is here, is that we have a very thick grid space. And here you have, for example, how the activity in the contact process, process decays when you run in it on the top of our network. That you have power laws, is obviously a lock, a lock, lock. The power law changes continuously as you change parameters in a range. It's not extremely broad, but it's not a point. It's, a, it's an interval. Okay. Again, <clears throat> also in, this is also interesting. If now in this system you study avalanches, that means you have a quiet state. You put activity somehow, and you study how large is the avalanche you generate, and you do the statistic of that. So the same type of experiment people do in the brain, in the, in the very first transparency. You study the distribution of avalanche sizes. And you have these very nice power laws, but now the advantage is that you do not have to set the system to just one critical point which is very specific, 2.576 certain with 100 decimal digits. You have a thick region, and you can move freely in this region, and you have power laws everywhere. Can that I, helps. Can I be nasty for a moment? Yes, please. Go, go, go back. How many decades I have? This is your question. I mean, if all, all the plots okay. here, all of them have a power law according to the data you show at experiment in the brain. So, so what? No, what's your, what's your nasty that, point? You don't need to be in the grid phase, you don't need to be in the active phase. In any of these phases, you can find a regime in which at least for one no. or two decades, you have a power law. No, no, no. For any valid parameter. I mean, if the parameter is very large, you, you know, know, at the beginning you have power law. But this oh, is yeah, just, just a transfer of it. It's not more than power law you see in the, in the graph you show us at the beginning. That's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. So for any of these spaces, you have a power law. No, no, no. But look at this power law. No, it's not the same thing. These power laws are in time. And the ones first were for sizes, avalanche sizes. So okay? No, no, no. You, can, you want to call this power law? It's well, not for one decade, yes. It's two decades. Same as the experiments. 
Okay. You can, you can, you can say that. Okay. If, I, I believe in what... Oh, yeah, okay, okay. It's good to, to be nasty. First, first, experiments have been redone for larger sizes, and they obey finite size scale. So, for example, they have them with 32 electrodes, 64, 100, 1 million, and they have very clean exponent. And uh, you do not get finite size scaling if you work there and you change system size. You do not see that. So this is not the part they are seeing exper experimentally. They are looking at tails of power loss. Okay? And uh, the, this is comparable with experiments. These are the size of, of avalanches in the way we count them. So this is the, the real regime comparable with experiments. And you have power loss only in the critic space. Here you have something like here with the peak, and here it's clearly exponential. So you have to be careful, I agree. And if you just call power law, power law, you can say very, a lot of nonsense, but we have to be careful. And, um, so what, what happens when things. you go to the active phase? The other one size, uh, the, 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 the probability of quarks, so You get things. You get that uh, from the, if you are active, yeah. what happens? You put an avalanche and then the whole system is active. So, the, the so the it can be the there. The avalanche is very big. It's huge. What you have is that some tiny avalanches and then a peak here of infinite avalanches. And if you wait more, this peak goes further, so you have huge things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, probably if, if you're in the active, what you see is something here for small avalanches, then nothing, and then a peak here corresponding to huge things. So it's the whole system? It's the whole thing active for, for some time. But you should observe some peaks at the different size of the, of the clusters of the different communities. Yeah, well, now depends exactly what you so plot here. One for the half of the hemisphere, or half of the, the, the brain, whatever, or one whatever. for the quarter, to see all the... Whatever. Mm -hmm. Something complicated. Anyway, it's not just those dynamical things, but here I'm plotting the susceptibility, which is a somehow bad, better way to characterize what's critical. You, you know, and this is important, that one of the possible reasons why the brain is critical or critical life is that critical systems are very susceptible. This susceptibility diverges. That means that you can have a very tiny perturbation and you have a huge response, which is very good. And some people claim that that's <coughs> the way in which the ear works, that you can have a bunch of very different ranges of excitation, of very tiny excitation, and you detect it. Because there is some amplification. The system is very susceptible. You have some type of amplification. And usually you have that at one point, the critical point. Here, what we have is a thick phase in which the response increases and diverges actually with, with system size. So the susceptibility is diverging. Also, the numerical evidence is not excellent, as Raoul could argue. But we have some evidence that susceptibility and also this dynamic range, which is something that neuroscientists measure, is also growing indefinitely. So now we move to the human connectome, okay? Because all we, I said was for these networks we have constructed. And for those networks, I can do finite size scaling, even if I didn't, didn't present them here, but we have very good evidence that we have real power loss with scaling and so on. But for the human connectome, I took the most detailed data and the people in the Connectome project were so kind as to pass them to me. And it's a network with uh, almost 1,000 nodes, and we know the strength of every possible connection between these 1,000 nodes. So we have the structure. And now we run our simple dynamical models on the top of that. And we get, for example, for the avalanche size distribution, these things. That Raul could tell me, okay, this is bending, this is not. Okay, we do some statistics, and the best fit is for power loss with continuously changing exponents. I cannot do finite size scaling here because I just have a brain on one size and it's bleed. But we have also generic power loss, and we can tune the slope by playing with, with parameters. So we have uh, evidence, but of course, always <coughs> just looking at power loss, even if you do it with some statistical tests, this is called Mogorov still not type of thing. It's not completely satisfying. So, well, before before moving ahead, I want to say, well, I skip this. I skip it. <laughs> I'm running late, so I skip it. Okay. As I was not fully satisfied, but looking at power loss, we did something of something else, and I am not going to enter the details here. But we have constructed spectral graph theory, a 
the dynamics on, on these networks, and, um, and found in these with its faces analytically. How should I summarize this? This is a bit technical, but let me give you just the key points on what, what's this thing of the spectral graph theory. Okay, this is the description of the dynamics I said before. So Q would be the level of activity, and you knew before in the model I put that activity dies at rate one, so you have this term, this activity just fading out. Or at rate lambda, if it was, if a neighbor was empty, this means a neighbor empty, or minus density, you can create activity from all the its nearest neighbors. So you have the node I, if it's active, can die at right one. If it's empty, at rate lambda, it can be infected by some other infected network. So the way to summarize the that dynamics, the contact force dynamics, is, is this thing here, where the topology of the connections is encoded in this matrix, okay, this adjacency matrix. Okay. So by doing, now you can take this and you can diagonalize this matrix, the type of things you do in linear algebra, you can do it here. And once you diagonalize this matrix, you have the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the connectivity matrix. Which is something that, oh, like the first thing you see, the, what are the vectors of the connectivity? It's something that you need to, to think a little bit about, about that. But it's, it's just like any other decomposition in, in eigenvectors and eigenmodes. So you can do this decomposition and study what's the decay of the first mode, second mode, and so on. Okay? What we have seen is that the matrix complicated. The matrix, when you diagonalize it, has a spectrum like this. What does it mean? Imagine we focus, for example, in the blue curve. The blue curve is the first eigenvector. The first eigenvector has component zero everywhere except at a few nodes. So when all activity has decayed except for the last the first whatever eigenvector, what you have is activity remaining in just very localized area. This is exactly what are the rare regions in the Griffith spaces I described before. You have this localization of eigenvectors, which is what in solid state physics is called Anderson localization. It's the same phenomenon. You have that electrons, when you, they move in a disordered solid, they get localized somewhere, so the electron is not anymore wave everywhere, but the electron is perfectly localized. We have the same phenomenon here. We have localization of activity in regions, but those are the regions I described before moving my hands. And these regions, like in, a, in, in the Anderson model, are like the defects or... I mean, For example, you can have a hub, a hub in the hub, hub okay. is where typically these, these leading ones are the, the largest hubs. But that depends on the dynamics. Okay, I studied here a contact process type of dynamics. Now, if you study something more sophisticated, you can have more interplay between hard, you can have explore different things. Okay? But and the then matrix. are just the involved of the connectivity matrix. Right. So they do not account for the dynamics. Right? Well, yeah, because. They, because the connectivity matrix? For example, yeah, you can change things. For example, if I study synchronization and I do it in two slides, then I have to change this by the Laplacian matrix, <coughs> which is related to this, but not the same thing. And then they can, they can, are different. They move, they shift, they do something else. Okay. So for the same connectivity, you can have different matrices depending on what dynamics you are studying. Okay? And uh, this is ja or, already very technical, but you can also show that the distribution of eigenvalues Okay, these are the eigenvalues, and this is the probability you have an eigenvalue, and it has a tail, and it tails has this type of singularity. Okay, all these things are known in solid state physics. This is called a Lipschitz tail, and when you have Lipschitz tails, you have 
So we have all these phenomenal of disorder systems. All that is in our networks, or is in the brain human connectome network. Okay. For example, a, a corollary of what I said, I know this is very technical, and I'm just trying to give you a game, so I, I don't pretend to have transmitted all the information, but just to give you some idea. But for example, this explains to you why a mean field approach cannot possibly work. In mean field approach, everything is connected to everything. Every net site can have any other possible random site. When activity gets localized or any type of dynamic gets localized in regions, this is opposite to mean field. This is not mean field dynamics. And mean field approaches do not work. Okay, this is something more about distribution of alien values. I, I skip it. This is for the human connectome. The, the one before was for the synthetic network. This is for human connectome, and you see here the peaks of localization. So here we have the 1,000 regions that we have, and here's how the first two eigenvalues localize, and they have this very irregular thing. This is not just that the first one, two eigenvalues are localized. We have hundreds of eigenvalues which are localized. But those eigenvalues are transformable? Yes, they are. Can you give any Sorry, why, uh, why, uh, The matrix we have originally symmetric. Oh. So it's, we are at, at least we are studying it from a symmetric symmetry one. We just study the connections. If we had more resolution and we had an asymmetric matrix and all that, we could have something more uh, more exotic. Mm -hmm. okay. It's just the way we study the matrix. Okay, so this regions could have something to do with what people are calling resting state networks, which are, if you take a, a subject which is in calm, the closest you can to doing nothing, then still you have some activity in the brain, and activity correlates between different parts, and we believe that these parts which are correlated as is just because they correspond to similar again, modes in the dynamics in the way we are standing. But I don't enter this. This is just, if I change the type of dynamic, as uh, mm -hmm. Peter was suggesting, now I'm studying synchronization. At the beginning I showed you some evidence that the synchronization is also critical somehow, some power loss. So we studied the Kuramoto model for synchronization, is Kuramoto model. <coughs> so essentially we have oscillators with some phases, with some intrinsic frequency, but they try to have the same phase as the neighbors. If you take a network, for example, in Ertos Reni, like this, you have standard phase transition, so disorder, critical point, order, synchronous. Instead, if we run the Kuramoto dynamics on the top of the human connectome, we get, guess what? A synchronous phase, an asynchronous phase, and something thick in between in which you have a mess. It's the regime in which you have all the different Areas, areas, and areas doing different things in a, in a funny way. So, for example, this is the Kuramoto order parameter for the connectome. You see these oscillations. We have some nice pictures here. Hmm? So we measure these phase lock intervals that I described before, and we get nice power loss, even if this was in progress. But this is very interesting because some people have just published. I got very excited about the, these results for synchronization. I went to look in the literature if someone has found something similar, and I found that two weeks before, <laughs> a group in Barcelona, this is Gustavo Deco, Gustavo Deco's group, has published this paper saying exactly the same thing we have found, but two weeks before. <laughs> well, some more before, because they wrote the paper and published it, so <laughs> maybe one year before. But what they find, something interesting, is that these are, empirical measurements, they have <coughs> different regions in the brain, they are codified with different colors. This is the synchronization, the, the Kuramoto angle of the oscillator, and this is asynchronous, this is synchronous, but in between they have a regime in which the blue things which are nearby are synchronous by themselves, but not synchronous with the rest of the thing. So we have partial synchronization within the different moduli. Okay, and when you have different moduli doing different things, you have something similar to this mess that I have here for the connection. 
But it's very interesting, according to these guys, because it's a, a way to process information. You can have that locally you are doing something, you can be synchronized, or organizing information in some way, but other regions are doing something different, and uh, of course you do not have always all these things without the brain synchronized all together, that will be very epileptic like of, of activity. Okay? So they claim that this is a very nice way to have a compromise. I think I wrote it somewhere, right? Okay? This is a very nice way to have a compromise between segregation, so different parts doing different things, and integration. They can talk to each other and eventually they can, they can interfere. Okay? But again, that's the concept of regions. But, but this, uh, to understand wrong, this is generic of the fact that you have communities. Yeah, but communities because... and communities within communities. If you just have communities at one level, the phenomenon is very okay, simple. Okay, understand. But mm -hmm. if, if there is community at one level, there is either nothing, several groups, total, total, total sequences. And if not, you have several levels. If you have at very different levels, then the intermediate part is similar. But, but basically, the fact is that you have communities, but doesn't tell you so how, what is the structure of the communities or, or... Put it the other way around. The more communities within communities you have, the richer the phenology is and the more things you can... So, so then that means that any system that has communities also will have grid faces? Or? No. For grid faces, you need hierarchy of communities in the thermodynamic limits, of course. Here you have finite networks and it's all, only an approximation. But to have the phenology of refits, you need at least a, a range of, of hierarchies. So any system, I'm rephrasing pairs, any system has communities of communities of communities of communities and you have uh, it's a, spaces? It's susceptible to do so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Last example, I think. I have an, uh, an about to finish. This is from my friends in Granada. And they had, at the very same time I was working on Griffith spaces, they cooked up this model that I will not describe, in which these are neurons and they are trying to store some, some something. For example, imagine these four neurons have to codify a bit one. So they, or well, this one here, a one. But instead of codifying the one in just one neuron, you codify the one in five neurons, all of them with the one. Okay? Because in this way, the, the codification cannot decay so easily. If it's just one and then some noise arrives, then you lose your information. So it was like a, a way to make the information story more robust. Instead of codifying just with one bit, codified in five things, you couple them together and you reinforce. So they, the information reverberates here. Reverberation is the word we use. They reverberate here for a while. Okay? And they take a, a network of neurons which is very heterogeneous, and they store information in, in different regions, and uh, they observe that memories, large memories, decay in time with the power law. <coughs> and this is just a manifestation of Griffith spaces. They have rare regions, because they have regions of very different sizes. The largest ones are very rare, but resist for a very long time, are exponentially rare, resist exponentially long time, and the convolution is a power law. So the process of forgetting, which is well known to be power law, could also be related to this type of, of phenomenology. And this is really just the last one. What I said for the brain can also work for other biological networks. For example, here we have some genetic regulatory WAN, and people have claimed that critical dynamics is important for genetic regulatory networks, and it's very fancy to study these things. And uh, it's also true that these networks happen to be hierarchical in hierarchical communities. And here is a connectivity matrix. So I haven't done anything with, uh, about this. Please don't do it before I publish the paper. <laughs> but it's very likely that we will observe something like Griffith spaces, rare region effects, and so on, also in genetic networks and other type of, of biological networks. So the take home message, Griffith spaces, Lipschitz cells, rare regions are natural and relevant concepts in neuroscience and biology. So thank you very much for the attention. We start your presentation telling us all about the advantages of critical in the brain deduced from just power laws. Let me show us, well, that's not the truth. Griffith faces show power laws as well. 
and they have a very different structure and very different nature than the criticality you right. decided before. Right. You still call it critical. But for example, the avalanches are now not statistically distributed anymore. Now they're determined by the communities. Right. The community but, but still, they have a poor law distribution. But which what, is what sense does it make then still to call all these things critical? So what you tell us actually is going to be careful. Right. If you detect the power law, right. it doesn't have, have to fulfill the right. requirements of criticality at all. Okay. And whether the, whether the advantages that have been associated with criticality in the brain still have any relevance in the Griffith case is unclear as well. Right. That's a very good way to put it. I, I agree with what you said. You have these power laws everywhere coming out of grid spaces. The way we choose to, to sell the concept was this stretching of criticality. Why? Because in empirical papers, doing experiments, they are saying, oh, look, in these networks, the criticality region is very thick. And we have an explanation for that. But of course, what you are saying is true. For us, for, for people in statistical mechanics, the critical point is something very specific with a fractal like a structure type of population. It's not the same thing as in the Griffith phase. But maybe you have an interplay between the two things. If you are at some finite distance of the critical point, you have critical like behavior, and then more power loss because you have communities, so, so you can have. In the, in the statistical sense, if in you look, for example, sense. for the distribution of the avalanches, <coughs> it will be very different because you, you, you know exactly what communities co co uh, correspond right, to the size avalanche, and yet they're not distributed equally. You are, you are very right, but look at that. What you get at the end of the day is this. So maybe the critical point is this, and when you are epsilon away from it, you get something very similar, because this moves shifts with continuity. So you can have something that looks very similar, but it's perturbed because maybe you have switched on some big community, but it's still it's a power law. So that's why I say maybe it's an interplay between critical things, then you go a little bit away from criticality, you switch on some communities, and you still get power laws, and you have a combination of criticality with something else. Maybe it only shows that the distribution function is not a good measure. It doesn't indicate much. Maybe. Mm -hmm. no, I don't know exactly what you mean by that. Well, I mean, if you cannot distinguish the mechanisms of criticality or cases oh, sure. or anything, what can you conclude from the, from the power? Yeah, but the thing is that the, the things people measure uh, are this. And for this, you get with the self. Sure. If you could have, for example, a spatiotemporal plot of how activity looks like, maybe it's quite, I mean, for sure, it's quite different here and here. Yes. No doubt about that. So you can call this pseudo-critical if you want, because you have power laws. And if you are more Taliban point of view, you can say, no, this is not critical. This is something else. This is a power law coming out of a Griffith space, which is a convolution of rare regions with exponentially rare. Power. OK. But you're perfectly right. You just call the Taliban. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have two questions. Uh, I mean, one of the criticisms that you make is that the critical point was just a point, right? And now the price you pay is that you well, I'm story. sorry, a, a criticism. I, I've, yeah, well, sorry. I've published many papers just on critical points, so I, I like critical points. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you are, but now the price you pay is that the, you have different exponents, right? Right. So now, if the experiment is always the same exponent, then you Which, have to fit this okay, that's a very good point. And actually, point actually, with the previous point of view that you have just one critical point, the exponent should be three halves, okay? Because it's a mean field model, a very small world network, and everybody should measure three halves in the decay exponent of the apple. Measure one point seventy-two. Wow, one these three halves plus error. One other one point four. I mean, there is a whole spread in values. But people say, no, this has to be three halves. And there is a consensus that should be three halves. But if you go look at the numbers, you have a dispersion. And this could be a way to explain the dispersion. Because some people are working here, some are here. And you have some values that, uh, well, I don't know where, but some, somewhere you see that can be three halves, but can be here. Can be three halves, but can be something larger, something smaller. It all depends on where you are. So I don't. And don't think now that the exponents they are measuring in experiments are so accurate as to, as to tell you that's really a critical point. It could be something else. Okay, the second is, I mean, for these rigid phases, uh, <coughs> you, you were saying that there was a convolution between the probability, I mean, the, the time and the space, right? Uh, well, in this community thing, basically, if you analyze the community structure, typically they are already vulnerable. 
We use measuring the size of the different communities. In many examples, the distribution is already a power. Right? So there, there is not a combination between the temporal and the size. Right. So I just, I mean, you are using the same concept, right? You need phase, but maybe it's not. Right. right. So it's, I think it's also related to what the Ingo was saying somehow. So right. it seems connected, but maybe it's a different thing. And uh, yes and no. Let me show you just something here, if I find it. One, ah, here. Here is the phase diagram of what you get for a random network, a running network, when you put some dilution, this is dilution. And uh, this is the, the same parameter in dynamics, the contagion parameter. You have a Griffiths phase here. And for example, here in the, on this line, which is right at the critical point, happens exactly what you said. The distribution of clusters it's a power law. It's a percolation. It's a percolation because yeah, it's the distribution of the percolation point. And here, instead of generic power laws, what you have is generic logarithms. Okay. So the phenomenology, making making short long story, is that rare regions is a big concept. Then you can have differences in the sense that you can have exponential distribution, power law distribution. You can have different type of dynamics. So you always have these rare region effects. That in some case, which is the one I studied, I call Griffith's phases because it's exponential, exponential. But you have uh, the concept of rare region effect is more general than Griffith's phases. That's what I try to say. Even though it is not rare because it's a power law, then you can have power laws, you can have a dynamic which is different. If you have a power law, then you have four sizes, so you don't have rare areas. All are no, rare. you have even more rare, rarer. No, they are the same because the mechanism is the same. Right, right, right. It's something else, and you get different laws. Hmm? What you were uh, showing here, because in, in this work you said that uh, uh, to, I mean, for this to work you have to have a network where, where the distances are following uh, to the uh, annex to the is that we have right. uh, a topological network, so in an equity space. Uh, what happens in the, I mean, because later you have passed the hierarchical uh, communities, um, there is any connection in, in this, or, I mean, I suppose that the network of hierarchical communities are small world, so they don't have this kind no, of... No, no, they are not. They are not? Okay. Lock loss. Okay. <laughs> so you have to still this kind of long distances in the right, right, right. As soon as I change parameters in my hierarchical model, mm -hmm. and this becomes this grows exponentially, so the, the, the connectivity is infinite. I <coughs> lose, I lose the effect. Well, I not, I don't lose the effect completely. I have a range of values of error in which I see strange effects. Mm -hmm. But then, when I go to large scales, everything is new. Okay. Any other questions? No, thank you. Thank you.